Hey everyone, welcome back to FPL Fran. Today's video is going to be the Game Week 33 cheat sheet. And I wanted to introduce a small change to the cheat sheet this week. So the cheat sheet will be divided into two parts just for the next two weeks, because I understand a lot of people are either implementing a free at 34 strategy, or of course, a strategy that, you know, is either a dead end in terms of maximizing the, the next two game weeks so game weeks 33 and 34 or of course you're just continuing to make transfers for the rest of the season uh, assuming that you've already made your chip so for people who are taking let's say a wildcard 35 strategy or a mainline strategy where you've already used your free hit the the first section of the cheat sheet is more relevant to you whereas of course if you're planning to use a free at 34 strategy i have illustrated alternatives and that will be the second half of the cheat sheet so for people who are new to the cheat sheet, the series is really just a look at all the positions in FPL, looking at the efficiency of certain players, tiering players based on whether I think they're differentials, whether they're best assets really to buy right now, and so on and so forth. So quickly heading on off to the main cheat sheet here, we don't have too many changes in the midfield position. I think part of this is because if you're, let's say, someone who's trying to think about transfers for Game Week 34 and also thinking about Game Week 35 where we have a Spurs double, I think Garnacho has to rise. I think Johnson has to rise as well. You know, Sarabia is already at that tier where I think he's just amazing as a glue player. Still, in my opinion, going to be on penalties. It will be interesting to see whether when Huang comes back, whether Sarabia will give away penalties to Huang. But I'm pretty sure the order goes Sarabia, Huang, and then Cunha. So let's see what happens to that in the meantime. Ganache, as I said, is very interesting because, of course, Game Week 34, it's not a double for United, but it's an amazing fixture. It's Sheffield United at home. So I think if, if you're the type of manager who, for example, looks at, let's say, Wolves' game and sees that there's an Arsenal fixture there, you don't think there's many opportunities for an, for an attacking asset. That's totally fair. You know, someone like Garnacho is understandably going to be a little bit better. But, of course, Sarabia has the intangibles like set pieces and potential penalties, of course, to, to remain with him for the time being. As far as someone like Johnson, though, I, I think that his underlying stats are incredible. And you can have a look quickly here at his expected goal involvement per 90. It's pretty frightening, right? It's at the level of some of the elite players within the league. Some of the elite, some of the players in the league who also have penalties too. So the fact that Johnson is running this hot, having played this much already, um, already shows that he's a very, very direct, very efficient player, in my opinion. Um, simply if you're looking at expected goals and expected assists, which is what we want from a player who's got five games in three game weeks after game week 34. So for me, that's why Johnson is sort of creeping up in terms of the priority. And also another thing to mention, of course, is that his minutes increasingly look good for the Spurs team. So we need to just monitor that and, and see, of course, whether he can keep his spot on the team. But right now he looks like a very good punt, given that he's also the cheapest Spurs midfielder to work with. As far as the Knicks here, no changes there. I think there's still an asterisk around Richarlison. Ultimately, though, of course, if this knee issue has been sort of something that's hampered him for quite a bit, I think that it's going to be an issue going forwards, right? Because yes, of course, he got rested in the previous match, but I don't necessarily know if he's already fit enough to suddenly just start the next match. It might be the case that we see Richarlison really play serious football around Game Week 35, which I think is a little bit of a tough call to make. I think what managers would like to see effectively is this week here in Game Week 33, potentially a substitution that's not just five minutes, not just 10 minutes, a serious substitution with Charleston allowing him to play 25, 30 minutes of football. Um, and maybe he even starts and plays 60 minutes instead as the alternative. And that would give us a lot more confidence in moving to Richardson around Game Week 35. Right now, I don't have that sort of confidence. As far as rises in the cheat sheet, we've got Havertz and Fernandes. Fernandes very much rising so for the same reason as Garnacho, right? Because of that, United great fixture in Sheffield United. And despite United, once again, being pretty horrific as of late, um, Fernandes has, of course, sprung into form. Um, that's not even something that we are really concerned with or overreacting to, in my opinion. The reality is, of course, United do have a double. Uh, Game weeks 34 and 35 are great fixtures. So for people who obviously are seeking a differential, I think Fernandes is, is very interesting. However, it's it's tough because, of course, if you're prioritizing Game weeks 34, you know you still have players like Luis Diaz and Havertz, of course. Havertz, the one who's also risen towards the green tier here, who is a little bit more interesting, of course, in the short term because you'd much rather you know put your or hedge your bets really around an Arsenal player uh, for the time being, or even a Liverpool player like Luis Diaz. One thing that we've always criticized Luis Diaz a little bit for is his expected goal involvement per 90, not being particularly high within the context of this Liverpool attack. This season, it's actually ticked up quite a bit, so it's actually improved year on year. And that's a really nice thing for Luis Diaz to, to sort of enjoy, because of course, when you compare him now to the, the same players within that sort of price point and that tier, or even the tier after that, which includes players like Odegaard and Foden, 
it's nice to see that he's in the company of certain players and that's very very good you know for from an FPL context not to mention that I think when Jota comes back it's still likely that Darwin is the one for me who would lose more minutes out than Luis Diaz who's just been playing amazing um, recently for Liverpool and so that's the midfield landscape pretty simple pretty simple pretty similar to last week but I think with some changes of course just recognizing that United's fixtures are getting better and better um, as we slowly creep towards the prime fixture in game 34 for them and then moving on of course to the forward position here we have Mateta with a rise I think there is of course going to be a concern with Eduard right he did come in in the previous game um, are Mateta's minutes poor not necessarily no but I think one of the concerns with Mateta anyways is that this Crystal Palace team is not very attacking at all and yes, of course, they did score versus uh, Man City, which was a bit dismaying. But ultimately, right, the expected goal involvement of Matata is very clearly poor compared to a lot of his peers within the cheat sheet, with exception to Hoyland, who also has notoriously bad expected goal involvement per 90. Although one thing I'll mention about Hoyland too is that his season is a little bit marred by the fact that I think he was obviously suffering from the injury, finding some form and not very productive at the first half and definitely got better in terms of even just getting into attacking positions which will obviously influence your expected goal involvement for 90. I still think that despite of course the change in manager that it's not like Mateta necessarily is a much better pick or that Crystal Palace have become so much more of a tremendous attacking team it's just the fact that his minutes have been really consistent and so that's a positive for Mateta and I'm just acknowledging that as we sort of get one game away from a tough fixture which is basically City and then obviously now Liverpool one game to go before you have a, a beautiful double on paper and I think when you compare all the forwards who have doubles in reality I still think Mateta is probably the most interesting one although maybe Calvert-Lewin is sort of in there a, a, as a shout for um, someone who's a very very interesting differential if he can stay fit for two fixtures and actually play those two games given that he's a penalty taker which is something that I don't think Mateta is necessarily. Uh, Cunha here also you know we kept him green last week I will still mention that maybe it's a, a mistake on my part as well I think a lot of Wolves predictors were also thinking that he'd play and start the previous game giving 32 now that hasn't happened but I still think that he'll start in giving 33 and really if I'm wrong here I just think that you can see that Wolves are taking extreme the cautious approach with their players and that should have a knock-on impact with Huang as well part of this reason of course is why I haven't included Huang the cheat sheet because it makes more sense to me that Huang of course would be shelved really until he's fully fit and, and of course you know when he's ready to play the same way Cunha has been given that he's also suffered a similar injury with a similar sort of injury timeline with Muniz here I've given him a drop Part of this, of course, is because you've come through a couple of good fixtures from Muniz. He has blanked in them. That's not something that we're super concerned with because the expected goal involvement for 90 is still really, really good with Muniz. The only thing I'll mention, though, is that competing with him is Wood, who actually seemingly has better minutes than him, given that he doesn't have that much competition. And Taiwo, of course, has struggled to stay fit. Plus, he's just played brilliantly. But these are the two sort of players who are at, at really good price points for people who have unique situations right let's say if you're really struggling bang for your buck to try get a player who you think can last for the rest of the season who you don't really mind just throwing in there as part of the bench boost as your worst player arguably um, on, on a double game week Muniz and Wood are very good for that especially for those lower budget teams and that's why we still have so much importance placed over Muniz and Wood it feels like a, it's, it's been a little bit late for me to include Wood in the cheat sheet, although I think it for people who've been watching the cheat sheets uh, and even, for example, my team sections in, in, from a few weeks back, um, you'll know that I, I have suggested Wood and I'm, 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 I'm a pretty big fan of Wood. So it's not like this is something that is completely blindsided me. Um, big fan of Wood, just giving him his, his props here as we look towards a really good fixture once again on Gaming 33. With Calvert-Lewin, as I mentioned, Chelsea's not a great landing spot, but I think when you also watch Chelsea's defense as of late, you probably think it would be. One thing I'll mention with Calvert-Lewin, of course, is that over the course of the season, the big struggling point has been really his fitness, right? There, there have been games where he's been benched. There have been games where he's not been in the squad. He does seem like he's in a good piece of form, on a, on a good run of form here, and hopefully he's physically fit too. Great fixtures in, in the double in the sense that they're attacking fixtures at home. Liverpool, of course, is going to be the bad fixture. But ultimately, you still have fixtures coming out of that that are really good. And another thing that's really nice about Carver-Lewin, as well as every Everton player, is that Game Week 37 is a great is a great fixture for this Everton team, despite it being just a single Game Week fixture. So we have the double Game Weeks being announced. But Game Week 37 is Sheffield United home for Everton. So that makes Carver-Lewin, for me, a very interesting differential. Semenya is someone that I've added, although he is, of course, he has a knock. I still think that 
by the time we get some press conferences, that knock shouldn't be an issue. Semenya is someone that doesn't really have a great game week 34 double, right? So the reason why we like someone like Solanke is because ultimately he's still a penalty taker. But Semenya, I think his minutes have actually really improved as of late. So I have no concerns over Semenya as a pick. My concern really is just about how valuable that double is. It's two away fixtures. Yes, of course, one of them is good in the sunset. It's Wolves. Um, but I still think that, you know, you're struggling here with someone who's probably going to have compared to the other forwards, you know, less expected goal involvement per 90. And you're really reliant as well on, you know, his ability to actually score despite the sort of poor underlying stats. So that's one thing that's interesting about Semenyo. Although one thing I'll mention too is that his price point is very intriguing. So it makes him a little bit better in the short term compared to Moniz and Wood, but then also a little bit worse in the long term. Because I think also when you look at Gaming 37, probably not a great Bournemouth fixture anyways. And I think a lot of people will be moving out of Solanke as well. João Pedro being added, but I think once again, he's he's someone that is more of an afterthought for now, right? He's building up fitness. He has a tough fixture in Gaming 34. He's more of a Gaming 37 option. Just someone to think about, sort of throw it in, into your mind right now. You know, what kind of transfers are you going to be making for Gaming 35, 36, 37? Uh, João Pedro should be within your thoughts. Werner for me is a differential. I still think that he's the most prone to losing minutes between himself and Brennan Johnson. So for that reason, I still think that he's a differential. On top of that too, I probably wouldn't want to waste the forward spot necessarily on him because I think that there's more guarantees within the Spurs team considering that Johnson, for example, is cheaper at a midfielder uh, if you want to go for someone with slightly dicier minutes. And of course, when you talk about, let's say, the defenders, once again, a cheaper access or route towards uh, those Spurs fixtures. As far as Hoyland, he gets a rise for the same sort of argumentation that we gave for your Brunos and your Garnachos. And that's pretty much the cheat sheet for now. I think looking at Watkins and his his brace, of course, you know, once again, respect just has to be shown to the great season that Watkins has played you know as a non-penalty taker someone who has pretty pretty average i would say underlying stats for how good of a team aston villa are on attack and still you know accumulating that many points compared to let's say uh your hollands of the world and some of the other premium assets so respect him but i think st i still think the fixtures are bad for aston villa and so you know when you're thinking about someone that you can keep for the rest of the season I would much rather sort of go towards an Isak now if you're not really comfortable with just embracing the doubles. So that's just the, the way I think. I think even going, for example, medium to long term, Watkins is just not a great pick. Although games 34, 35, they do look like great fixtures. And so I know a lot of people have been intrigued in keeping Watkins and Gross as a bit of a sort of rotation duo. And, and that's fair enough if that's worked out for you as a strategy. But that's a very unique case for a lot of managers. And I still think ultimately, unfortunately, he still deserves to be a differential at this moment in time. As far as the defense, moving on to that, not too many changes here. I've added Tarkovsky just for the element of illustrating, you know, who I would rather go for within this Everton team. Yes, Miklenka was in, in, in the bonus in the previous match, and, and part of that really is because Tarkovsky got a yellow card. Now, Tarkovsky, of course, is much more prone to getting a yellow card, but when you actually look at it, for example, expected goal involvement, you can see that he almost doubles Branthwaite, which already illustrates, maybe even intuitively, that he's actually a better set-piece threat. But the biggest thing, too, is how many shots on target per game um, Tarkovsky has over Branthwaite. That's really illustrative as well of how much of a set-piece threat he is and how often he's able to make himself a set-piece threat too. So uh, that that's why I think Tarkovsky, if you have that sort of money to sort of spend and it's, it's not going to hamper your team in any sort of way, I still think Tarkovsky is an upgrade overall over Branthwaite. And um, that's sort of how I see things at this moment in time. As far as some drops, we have Bradley because Trent is back in training. Uh, Chris Richards is still with an asterisk around him because I don't really know the injury timeline. We probably need an update on that, to be honest. Regulon, a differential here, just because when you look at the fixtures in the distance, and obviously we've talked about this before, but Brentford have amazing games to close the season out despite ha not having doubles. And so Regulon here is just a fantastic transfer for some people seeking a differential. Potentially, of course, if you're, let's say, even you know dead-ending, your team is already very much set up for gaming 34, or you even want to go for Regulon versus Luton, you know, this is an opportunity here with the differential. Uh, Robertson has also been added to the cheat sheet. I still think that maybe I've been a little bit too optimistic over Robertson, but I think he's played well recently. And I do think that his minutes are, are going to slowly tick up a little bit as we cross over to the sort of business end of the season. He's found a lot of minutes in his boots. He's definitely fit again. And I really do like Robertson as a pick going forwards. But for me, Virgil, of course, is so much safer and so much more guaranteed. It's very likely and, and very possible too that Robertson could miss out on some of the key minutes within the double game week. And, and if that's the case, of course, you've got Virgil there who gives you that full safety. 
And of course, it's just a great set piece threat too. But you can look at, for example, for example, the expected goal involvement per 90 of a lot of these defenders here. You know, outside of Regulon and Bradley or Poro, there's no one really to compete with Robertson um, who's actually fit right now. It's Trip here and Trent, obviously, but they're still sort of on the sidelines and we'll have to see when they come back um, fully. As far as the goalkeepers here, we've got Kelleher dropping for the same reason. Allison is in parts of training as we've heard from Jurgen Klopp. As far as Petrovic, I do think he's played pretty poorly recently. And I'm not saying that he's going to lose his spot in the team because unfortunately for Chelsea, Sanchez is not a very brilliant goalkeeper. So when you're, let's say, replacing Petrovic with Sanchez, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of particular upside. So maybe the the the, the thing that sort of is keeping Petrovic alive within this the t this team is just how bad the options are for Chelsea. And and that's all I have to say on Petrovic. Otherwise, of course, we've got Ortega being added as a differential. And of course, you can see Ortega and Ederson on the cheat sheet. The reality here is that we've seen Ortega play in the Champions League. We're starting to see Ederson on the bench. Now, Ederson, of course, is close to full fitness, as Pep has confirmed. But there is a genuine question to ask of whether Ortega will maybe take away the minutes from Ederson towards the end of the season. And a lot of people will be interested in this because... Ultimately, when you're crafting, for example, a bench boost in Gaming 37, maybe you're struggling to actually pick City, City players, and that goalkeeper could be a pivotal part of that. So something to, to look at. I obviously wouldn't be transferring in either of them now, but it's just something that we need to just be open to. Particularly, of course, if Ortega seems like he's going to keep his spot in the team, you're actually looking at a Man City goalkeeper for a ridiculous price. And it kind of reminds me of a lot of the managers who recently went into Kelleher and really enjoyed some of the dividends there because, of course, that allows you to make an even stronger outfield 11 um, or, or really 13. So that's just um, something to think about there. Now, quickly shifting gears towards the, the sort of free hit 34 sort of cheat sheet for managers who are making transfers, you know, without 34 in mind. What we can see here, of course, is that we've removed game week 34. Instead, you're seeing game weeks 35 and 36, because in reality, the next three game weeks for you um, are those game weeks. And so your transfers this week, too, are sort of very dead end based in the sense that you can actually already go for someone who's got um, good fixtures in 35, good fixtures in 37, and just hopefully as well, a good fixture in game week 33, and you can ignore game week 34. So your your essays of the world, your leases of the world will not feature here. And that's sort of the, the big change. And that's why there's also no greens, uh, green arrows, red arrows, and, and even, for example, new introductions, because of course, this is a new cheat sheet. Um, so Garnacho Johnson at the top, this is because of course, Garnacho will double in game week 37. Um, you do miss out, unfortunately, on the game of 34 fixture versus Sheffield United at home, which is something that's a little bit bittersweet, but I still think United have an amazing double in game of 37. That's really where the value is coming from. Plus, you still get game of 35 versus Burnley. As far as Johnson, as I've illustrated uh, previously in some of the videos, he just has really great value as someone who I think is probably the cheapest access to a pretty consistently playing Spurs midfielder or attacker, if you want to put it that way. Much more guaranteed sort of minutes over someone like Richarlison, who I still think is a little bit of an unsafe play right now. Um, and even Madison, for example, with slightly diminished minutes and at, at a much more sort of lucrative price makes him a little bit tougher to access. So I think Johnson obviously is, is the option that I'll be looking for. Your two differentials here are Enzo and Gallagher, and that's simply because Chelsea will have five fixtures and three. And that's something that's in interesting to think about because, of course, even from a gaming 33 point of view, you actually have a pretty good fixture at least because it's at least a home fixture um, there. So something to think about for your Chelsea players and your Tottenham players. As far as Gordon and Palmer here, um, we've got Gordon and Palmer because ultimately, once again, with this Newcastle team, great fixtures in the short term. You still capture the Game Week 35 fixture versus Sheffield United home. So an even better upgrade compared to, let's say, United fixture wise. And then, of course, you're going to double in Game Week 37. And, and, and Gordon, of course, someone who's been very fit for most of the season, just an amazing pick. Palmer, too, nothing more to say about him. As far as sort of big changes within the previous cheat sheet as well, is I think it's just that we probably have to devalue Arsenal a little bit, right? They don't have any doubles left. They're an amazing team and they have good fixtures because they are the good team, right? So every other team sort of that they're about to face is going to be uh, the easy fixture per se, uh, with exception to some of the tough games that they have left. So that that sort of perspective is why Saka is a yellow. That's why Havertz is a, is a yellow. The same reason why Luis Diaz and Salah are yellows too. 
On the other hand, of course, you've got players like Fernandes and Son who just have more fixtures with De Bruyne, a differential just because I still think the minutes are going to be dicey for him, um, particularly if, let's say, if City progress within the Champions League, you're still probably going to see that De Bruyne is prioritized for those matches as opposed to Premier League matches, which is my concern. As far as, let's say, a Rashford, he's also been added as a differential. Gross as well, just because I think with Gross, it's a little bit tougher to want to go for Gross because I still think that the short-term fixtures for other teams, like let's say a Gordon, um, are better. A Palmer are better too. So for me, G Gordon is someone that Gross is someone that you probably want to think about as a differential um, even later down the line. Unless you, of course, are keeping Gross and you still want to use him as a differential. With your forwards here in Free at 34, the main change, of course, is that you care less about the Gaming 34 doubling forwards. And so Muniz and Wood are even better in the sense that, once again, they're, they're your glue guys for potential uh, players who are looking for upside. With Jao Pedro, with him coming back, um, the only thing would be, you know, how does Brighton team manage his injury load and, and his recovery? But I think, of course, as weeks go by, and as Gaming 37 is impending with the great double there, Ja Pedro is just going to be an even better pick. And you'll see him rise um, on this cheat sheet as well, as well as the main cheat sheet. Uh, Morris, just the only sort of pick that if you really wanted to sidestep Muniz or Wood for whatever reason, just another player here who's guaranteed penalties and, and somewhat decent expected goal involvement per 92. Jackson is the main sort of benefiter or benefactor, I suppose, of of the change in the cheat sheet setup because when you ignore game week 34 which is of course chelsea's worst fixture jackson becomes a, an Im immediately impressive pick because yeah that's pretty much what it comes down to as far as hoyland the same sort of situation there although you do miss out game week 34 versus sheffield united home uh the big thing once again is that the importance of the doubles are, are gone you therefore prioritize your united players esoc still remains as a green pick Solanke falls here within this cheat sheet. Darwin is even even less important, I would say. Jota coming back is huge. You miss out two fixtures from Gaming 34, which are probably weeks or fixtures rather where Jota can build up on fitness. And it's a concern as far as Tony Watkins, no changes there. With Holland, interestingly, of course, still a green pick. I think there's something to be said about some people being critical of you know Holland's role within the team, his impact within you know, both the Premier League and the Champions League. Something to monitor for sure, but I still think I'd be very confident that Holland is, as a very young player as well, fit enough to play a lot of these fixtures and still going to be an incredible goal threat. So am I concerned really with Holland as a pick? I wouldn't say so, to be honest. I think that's a, a little bit too risk-seeking for me to to just immediately dismiss Holland as a pick, particularly when, when you can see you know someone like Foden, who's got a dead leg this week, will have to manage that and um, deal with that issue, whereas Holland is very likely to play versus Luton. So one thing that I would mention about Holland is that we can reassess on someone like Holland you know, by the time Gaming 35 rolls around, because maybe, of course, on Gaming 38, you're going to captain someone like Salah instead, if you prefer that. Um, on Gaming 37, though, you could very well captain another City player, maybe Foden instead, if you really don't like Holland. Um, but that's something I think we can just reassess as a narrative, and also just to see whether, of course, the minutes for Holland um, slowly change, because as you can see, of course, we have seen a rest recently for Holland, but that usually for me is, is just a sign that that's his one one game of rest and, and he can be managed later down the line. So um, we'll see with Holland, but uh, something to think about. As far as the defense, the main change here, of course, is that you, you can see that the Brighton and Newcastle players, and especially the Spurs players too, um, have been pushed up within this cheat sheet. Because of course for Spurs, you're, you're ignoring a blank entirely. You have just more fixtures than the rest of the field over the next four or five game weeks. With Brighton and Newcastle, you have a double game week and you're just really, really cheap if you go for options like Van Heck or Burn. With Shar, I still think I have to give him his flowers in the sense that he does have some inherent value as someone who's a bit of a shot spammer, someone who does have quite good expected goal involvement um, as a center back and also someone who usually does find his way towards bonus, particularly if someone like Trippier isn't playing. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. With Gusto, players like Regulon, Van de Ven, um, even Ait Nuri. I think obviously Regulon and Ait Nuri are your differentials in the sense that they have great fixtures, great singular fixtures, even when you take away Game Week 34 from them, right? Which is going to be Luton away for Regulon and of course the double for Ait Nuri. But the main thing is that these are such attacking players right now, particularly with their role within the teams. And that makes them interesting if you want a differential and, you're, and you really don't have any appetite for, let's say, a Van Heck, where you don't have too much faith in the clean sheets for whatever reason, things like that. Or even Gusto, where you're looking at this Chelsea team um, being very poor. But Gusto, also one thing I'll mention about him too, is that 
Pochettino basically confirmed that he was ill the previous week. He got a rest for Sheffield United. I'd be pretty confident in playing Gusto versus Everton at home. Going forwards, though, we have Branthwaite as well. Same same logic of game week 37 being a really good fixture for Everton, even if it's just a single game week. With Disasi, it's just about maximizing the amount of fixtures that Chelsea have. Um, and then outside elements of the cheat sheet, we don't have Robertson here because I still think he's a little bit too much of a differential. You probably don't care about Liverpool too much anyways, um, as they're so expensive. And as you can see, for that reason too, Virgil drops, whereas Trippier is an interesting sort of asterisk point because for people who are going to be looking at transfers in the short term, of course, if, if let's say Trippier is available by game 35, he becomes an immediately interesting transfer to make. And then with the goalkeepers here, the only change, of course, is that we can see a, a higher preference towards game 37 playing goalkeepers, less less of us caring about Pickford and Raya, to be honest, because, of course, game 34 is a big piece of why they're fundamentally some of the green goalkeepers within the other element of the cheat sheet. And that's really, really it. We just need to stay monitored towards the Ortega situation. Verbruggen, for me, is too much of a differential, but I, I've put him here as an asterisk. I just think that at some point in the season, we might see, still, still see Steel come back. Um, and it kind of reminds me of when I wildcarded into Sanchez last season and, and this exact same thing happened. So I wouldn't take that risk with Verbruggen. And that's pretty much it for the cheat sheet this week. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care and goodbye.